It's December 30th, 1862. Just outside of Murfreesboro are two armies of almost equal size. General Rosencrantz Union Army and Braxton Bragg's Confederate Army. And they have laid a long front all along what is known as Stones River. They know that tomorrow they will be engaged in a great conflict. As nighttime is getting ready to put everybody to bed, as much as one can sleep when they know they're about ready to fight, one of the regimental bands, and we don't know who, started playing Home Sweet Home. As it played, another regimental band joined in, and then another, and then another. On both sides, the entire front, bands and men, came in unison to sing Home Sweet Home. As the song came to a conclusion, all quiet was on the battlefront as men sat there in solitude and sorrow. I'm here at Stones River National Battlefield. Now, this battle on a sheer ratio percentage, ratio percentage will have the highest number of casualties in the entire war. But before we get into this battle, uh, remember to subscribe and hit that notification button so you're familiar anytime I upload stories about the Civil War or any of my other two classes, such as film study where I talk with filmmakers about their crafts or my recent US history class. So if this battle here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee has the highest percentage ratio out of all of the battles in the war, how did we get here? Well, first let's rewind a little bit. In late October of 1862, Don Carlos Buell, who was unable to capture Braxton Bragg's army at Perryville, will be replaced with William Rosecrans. And yes, it's Rosecrans, not Rosencrans like I often mispronounce, but Rosecrans. Anyways, General Rosecrans was a devout Catholic who often shared his faith and testimony with his men and was known to carry with him a rosary and a crucifix. Eventually, decades after the war in 1896, the University of Notre Dame will award him the Latari Award, the most prestigious award for American Catholics. But that's for another tell. When given command, it was expected for old Rosie to immediately pursue Braxton Brack. However, he did not. Instead, Rosie worked on training his troops in Nashville, leaving Bragg open to once more invading Kentucky. Bragg, who was just over 30 miles to the east of Rosie, camped in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, along Stones River. It is not until Rosie was threatened to be removed from command did the general finally make movements towards Bragg at the end of December. Rosie arrived at Stones River on December 29th with 40,000 men. Bragg was almost even in size with 38,000. The two forces scouted each other on the 30th, and that brings us back to where we started the story off with both sides singing Home Sweet Home on the evening of the 30th. To me, that song had to be emotionally overwhelming because both sides knew the 31st was going to bring carnage. Both sides knew whoever struck first was going to carry the momentum of the battle. Both sides made plans. Rosie was going to strike immediately after breakfast. Bragg, however, ordered to attack at first light. On December 31st at 6 a.m., Confederate forces hit the Union line who were still in the process of cooking breakfast. Union troops to the southernmost extent of the line were caught off guard. Although they knew they would be in a fight, the far southern flank of the Union line was still completely unprepared and will fall back in a full retreat. Parts of the Union line fell back as far as three miles even. 
what saved the Union line from completely being routed was General Phil Sheridan, who, although seeing the troops to his right flee, will hold his ground, keeping the line protected in the Union Center. On the early morning hours of December 31st, Phil Sheridan knew that there was going to be an attack, and so he ordered all of his men to have an early breakfast and to be ready for an assault by the Confederates. And sure enough, General Sheridan was correct. The assault does come, and where other Union regiments actually literally turn and flee, Phil Sheridan has his men holding strong and buckling down. And it's because of Phil Sheridan's heroics that Rosencrantz is able to reorganize these Union soldiers that were fleeing and to create a stronger secondary front line that will be key for Rosencrantz to win this battle here at Stones River. But again, it doesn't always come to the guys who are at the very top. Sometimes heroics takes place by people seeing, hey, there is a situation and I need to take care of it. And Phil Sheridan, he's one of those generals that recognize that. Although heroic, Sheridan's stand came at a great cost. His corps will suffer a horrendous consequence as a third of his division will become casualties. One section of Sheridan's troops had rocky formations that gave them a strong defensive fortification. However, the Confederates eventually flanked the Union stand there, and instead of offering protection, those rock formations made it very difficult to retreat from. Unable to escape, many Union soldiers will be pinned in the rocky terrain and fall to Confederate guns. Those that escaped will share the horrific sights of the battle reminded them of the slaughtered pens in the stockyards of Chicago. The name will stick, and this area of the battlefield will be remembered as the Slaughter Pen. In addition to the heavy number of casualties, all three of Sheridan's brigade commanders will die on the field. Wow, the Slaughter Pen? Slaughter indeed. Meanwhile, as Sheridan's divisions are fighting desperately, Rosecrans is riding all along the line, trying to rally his men to hold their positions and meeting with his officers in an emergency meeting. Late in the morning during the attack, Confederates are firing. General Rosencrans is trying to rally his troops, being surprised by Bragg's bold move. Um, and with General Rosencrans is his chief of staff, uh, General Thomas, General Sheridan, and they're working on how to rally his men. When all of a sudden Rosencrantz's face is covered and splattered with wet, fresh blood. It was the blood of his chief of staff, who was decapitated by a cannon canister. Real quick, I need to interrupt here and just let you know who Rosencrantz's chief of staff was. Julius Garrache. Um, the two are best friends, Rosie and Garrache. They come together from West Point. Matter of fact, Garrache is actually responsible for converting old Rosie from being a Protestant to a Catholic. And Garrache has spent his whole life uh, doing Catholic work, being a strong humanitarian. Actually, shortly before this battle, Garrache's brother even writes him and says, I fear, I have this premonition, this dream that said, you will die on your first major conflict. And Sure enough, in Garrache's first conflict, when the battle is upon him, a canister literally goes through his head, decapitating him, leaving just his lower jaw left. Supposedly, even after the cannonball canister went through his head, he, his body stayed upright and rode along the horse for a little bit before eventually collapsing. Rosie did not have time to mourn, even though he is literally covered with his good friend's blood, the friend that converted him from Protestant to the Catholic faith. No, he has to engage his men and rally his men in this horrific battle that is taking place. And it's not until that evening is he able to mourn and says, in battle, good men die. Rosie, 
as a sign of love for his loss of his dear friend, takes off his buttons from his jacket and keeps them in a special place, writing on a note saying, these were the buttons I was wearing when Garishay died. And although that story is powerful and moving, there is a huge, oh my gosh, moment from it. Yes, Rosie is covered in the blood of his dear friend, but it was a canister that took off Garishay's head. A canister is something that is supposed to explode. And Rosie was meeting with the rock of a future rock of Chickamauga, General Thomas and General Sheridan, who's going to be mostly responsible for cutting off Lee's escape route near Appomattox. So had that canister exploded where it was supposed to, not only would it have killed Garishay, but it would have killed all of the Union command under Rosencrantz's army. Though suffering horrendous casualties, Rosie's Union lines held at the end of a day on December 31st. Meanwhile, Bragg's assault, which had initially seen success moving part of a Union line in the early hours, had stalled. The Confederates also had a high number of casualties. There was very little reason to celebrate the countdown on this New Year's Eve. On January 1st, 1863, both sides rested, treated the wounded, and observed the New Year. After a hard New Year's Eve, both Confederates and Union troops rested. But the fighting was not done. January 2nd, Braxton Bragg ordered Kentuckian and former Vice President as well as presidential candidate John Breckinridge to assault the heavily defended Union line of fellow Kentuckian Thomas Crittenden, who was the son of John Crittenden of the Crittenden Compromise. Two major Kentuckians from two opposing sides of the war. It's January 2nd, 1863, and January 1st, there was really no fighting. As a matter of fact, it was just the Union line getting itself stronger here. Uh, and Rosencrantz has created a line of 57 artillery pieces all lining along this ridge here. Braxton Bragg has gotten intelligence that there is a very weak Union line here and orders the Kentucky Orphan Brigade, led by, at this point, uh, Breckenridge, General Breckenridge, to make an assault. Now, I talk more about the Orphan Brigade and Breckenridge in our notes on Chickamauga. You can look at those there. Breckenridge, though, he's seen what has developed on January 1st here. He's just over there and he knows it would be suicide to come here. So he tells Braxton Bragg, no, that, that's a bad idea. And he even draws in a dirt showing where all of these artillery batteries are at, saying, this is really bad. But Bragg is like, no, your, your observations are wrong. I know my intelligence that I'm receiving is correct. You will make this attack. Breckenridge witnessed this being put up. And Bragg is like, you're wrong. So with a lot of protesting, Breckenridge does what he's ordered to do, begrudgingly. And the Orphan Brigade, as well as other Confederate divisions, come this way only to be slaughtered, massacred, murdered by Bragg's commands. And as the Orphan Brigade returns back to their lines, the few survivors that managed this assault come to see Breckenridge, and Breckenridge is overwhelmed with emotions. And he cries, my orphans, my orphans. To get a strong understanding of artillery, let's go back to the battlefield park with two special guests. All right, guys, we have two special guests here with us today. We have Richard Miller, who is the gunner, and John McKay, who is working on the crew uh, with the artillery. And they are going to share and demonstrate what it was like to fire, fire uh, an artillery. Hey, well, this is one of the smaller cannons and older cannons uh, used at this battle. It, uh, it was actually made prior to the Mexican War, uh, 
and then pulled out of the arsenals uh, for use in the uh, early part of the U.S. Civil War. Uh, it fires a six pound projectile, uh, one of three types, uh, a solid iron ball which can be skipped across the ground uh, to knock down people at the far end, knock down buildings, rock walls, or just scare the uh, lines coming uh, towards it. They can see the ball coming, they'll jump out of the way, their sergeants get upset because they've lost their uh, precise formations needed to control their firepower. So you gain time at the extreme range. Second round this gun fires is called case shot. It's a hollow cannonball with a time fuse and a bursting charge inside with uh, musket balls. Uh, you fire that through the air and try to get it to explode above and in front of the troops that are coming at you. Uh, if you get the air burst uh, time properly, the metal fragments come down and cause multiple casualties. Uh, it's a uh, case shot was uh, developed after a British uh, inventor or uh, army officer Henry Shrapnel uh, that produced it in England and it very effective uh, round. The last shot this gun used uh, is a canister. It's a big tin can filled with 27 and one inch iron balls. It's a shotgun round for this cannon. So it ranges of 300 yards and closer. It's, it's very devastating. Uh, and in a, extreme emergencies, you can actually uh, uh, multiply the, um, the canister. Uh, put one canister in, tear the powder bag off a second one, put it on top. You're firing 54 balls at once uh, at ranges of 100 yards and closer. Correct. Uh, this artillery piece is a crew serve weapon. You need um, ideally eight people uh, to load and fire it mo uh, very efficiently. You can do it with lower numbers. Uh, the gunner is a corporal. He's in charge of aiming and coordinating the loading of the piece. Uh, two guns are under the command of a lieutenant. Uh, six guns are under the command of three lieutenants and one captain overall. That's the battery organization. Uh, everybody else is a private. Uh, and they're identified by the number, uh, the position they serve on the gun. So on the front you have one and two. They, um, number one holds the uh, sponge rammer, the staff used to uh, load and fire, the, uh, to load the cannon. Three and four are directly behind them. Uh, they prime and uh, discharge the piece. Then the gunner stands at the back of the cannon. Number five and seven uh, run the ammunition back and forth and uh, the number six uh, cuts the fuses at the gunner's instruction. So gunner is pretty much just the coordinator of all these people working together. Uh, takes a lot of practice. We do it a lot slower as a park service drill, uh, but they could, if they had to, uh, 15, 25 seconds, somewhere in there. Uh, depending on how many safety steps they choose to uh, omit because they're being fired at. They got one order, take that hill. Somehow they luck up and get on that hill. They're like king of the mountain, they're on that hill. What happens is those Union soldiers are now running down that hill. Now they had orders to hold and basically stand down on that hill. 
But when you get a predator-prey relationship and you see those men in blue heading down towards that river, all of a sudden instincts locked in and those men start making their way after those, those men in blue. When they make it around a partition of earth and around through those trees, it's ironic that's where they were starting this battle off, where the Union Army was supposed to cross that first day and were called back because the left flank of the Union forces on McCook's side had folded. They had to go from offense to defense. Now they're on the opposite side where they were called back that first day. They're over there again on the west side. And once they get down to that river pursuing those men in blue, the last man skips across there like a stone. Well, it's nothing but a sea of gray now on the east side of the river. And all of a sudden those men look up and there's 57 Union cannon pointed point blank range at them. If you didn't already know this, I think our gunner just said every 15 seconds you can pull that lantern. And that lanyard goes off every 15 seconds for 45 minutes. There's going to be 1,800 Confederate wiped out with those Orphan Brigade leading that charge. Now the Union soldiers are going to run back across that river and try to pursue what's left. One thing Breckenridge did do that he couldn't stop this order, but he could choose what time he's given it. This is a ladder part of the shortest day of the year. Just had winter solstice. We're right now just past summer solstice. So we're on the opposite side of the spectrum. If you got that darkness coming down, then Breckenridge knew this goes wrong. He, before he left, he told him, he says, this has got wrong written all over it. If I don't return, make sure that they know that this was Bragg's blunder, not mine. He delayed the order. So when they got across that river, the Union soldiers to pursue them. By the time they got to the tree line, darkness had prevailed. That's the end of that day. But the Confederates don't answer the bell the next day. That's the end of it. But the men are firing those cannons off in blue. You got the Kentucky Ninth, you've got their own cousins and brothers, literally are, you hear about this all the time, are literally fine. The two strongest political powers of Crittenden. On this side, that's his left. It's Mendenhall's men that they're fighting those cannons off. But you got Breckenridge and Hanson's brigade are meeting each other. And that's the final of this climax this battle. So you boys of Trinity in those Louisville, Kentucky seats might enjoy something about your own state. On the early hours of January 3rd, Rosie began to receive reinforcements from Nashville. Confederate General Braxton Bragg knew the chance of victory was no longer possible and after suffering catastrophic casualties, abandoned the field at Stones River. President Lincoln wired Rosie a congratulatory thank you for the victory. For Lincoln, after seeing another failure in the East with General Ambrose Burnside at Fredericksburg, and the release of his controversial Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, the victory by Rosie was much needed for the President. But the victory came with a cost. The Union suffered 12,906 casualties. The Confederates lost 11,739. The combined 24,645 casualties from both sides was a staggering 32%. This will be the highest percentage of casualties of any major battle in the Civil War. A higher percentage than Gettysburg, Antietam, or even Shiloh. But fellas, I want you to remember how this story started with the night before the battle, when men from both sides were singing home sweet home. A ballad that shares there is no place like home. When you remember that, it becomes haunting that for many, they will never know the comfort of home again. Alright fellas, Trinity English teacher and guitar teacher as well as music musician, Mr. Jason Daniel. Hi guys. Mid pleasures and
Make sure you subscribe and hit that notifications tab so that way you know anytime that we upload one of these stories for you for the Civil War. Um, guys, this has been a great trip. I've gone from Fort Henry and Donaldson with you to Shiloh, to Vicksburg, to Chattanooga and Chickamauga, and now here at Stones River. And this was all made possible by a wonderful former student who nominated me for the Toyota Thanks Teachers Program, which was paired for the National Centers for Family Learning. So thank you to all three of you for making this part of this trip so, so beneficial. I am very humbled and thankful that I was able to do this because of your generosity. So this is the end of this series and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I clearly think I need to do a future series out on the Eastern Campaign and hopefully one of these days uh, here soon we will be able to do that. And, but until then, you guys remain awesome, be nice, stay safe, and I'll see you soon. Guys, turning to legend. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is the update. Turning to legend. What am I? <laughs>